Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to AMPC's third webinar in relation to workplace safety. Today's session is on how to manage claims liability. So thank you for attending. For those that have previously joined us, you will um, know how the system works a little bit. So today we've got Simon Booth presenting to us. Just if anyone wants to ask a question throughout the session, we really encourage questions. You Unfortunately, you're unable to ask the question direct, and that's just because when we've got a number of attendees on, it can be a little bit hard to manage. So what we're doing is asking everyone to write their questions in the question box that you have on your toolbar, and then I'll send those through to Simon, and at the appropriate time, he will be able to answer them. Now, if for some reason we don't get to all the questions or we need to come back, we'll make sure that we come back to you. Um, everyone should have received a workbook today. Thanks to Simon for putting that together. And that's just a bit of a ready reckoner for you to be able to use down the track. This web webinar is being um, broadcast as well. So feel free to get in contact with us if you'd like a copy of it. I know a number of you have been sending it around through your organisations as a little bit of a learning tool for your supervisors and managers, which has been fantastic to see that these are being able to be used. All right, Simon, over to you. Thank you. Okay, so before we get into the part about influence claims, influencing claims liability, just uh, wanted to go through a few things that we're doing with the AMPC over the next uh, 24 months. Uh, most of you would probably remember that uh, in conjunction with the, uh, the Australian Ministry, uh, we did a, 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 a survey. So I'm trying to look at myself and a, and a presentation, which is putting me right off. I should just turn my camera off. There we go. Well, not turn it off, put it away so I can't see myself. So we did a, a study for the meat industry where we looked at what's driving workers' compensation premiums, which are quite high across the country. Um, with that, uh, what we came up with or what we did was analysed over two and a half thousand claims and visited 28 processes around the country, uh, actually asking them questions around their risks, uh, their safety and their work, the response to workers' compensation. That gave us a lot of insight into what was going on and where perhaps some of the barriers to achieving uh, better return to work, better claims uh, management and better safety were coming from. What we identified out of that was there was a bit of a gap uh, with knowledge and education where a lot of people had come up through the ranks inside the industry into roles in safety, into roles in uh, return to work. And as much as that meant they had a great foundation of, of the, the business that they were in, it sometimes meant that they were lacking the knowledge or the recent knowledge in what was going on in the industry uh, to achieve better return to work outcomes. We also noticed, which was no surprise, that sprains and strains, musculoskeletal injuries, were the biggest driver of claims for the industry. What was a bit of a surprise was lacerations. Uh, when we did our site visits, every company told us they had lacerations under control. Uh, you know, appropriate use of PPE, all those sort of things, had, in their minds, had actually had that under control. What we found was it was still making up close to 30% of claims. Uh, and you know, an and, and equivalent uh, impact on costs. So with a lot of the initiatives that we're looking at, sprain, strains, musculoskeletal lacerations made up close to 80, 87% of the claims and costs that we have to deal with. So obviously that needs to be an area as an industry that we focus on and find some improvement. Uh, what we also found was that older and younger uh, workers were disproportionate in the number of claims and the duration of claims that they were having. Uh, younger workers, no surprise, the bulk of their injuries were lacerations. So not really understanding the, the dangers or the hazards that the, that the knives uh, possessed and learning the hard way that they had to be respected. Now, older workers, what was found was it was so sprains and strains. The body's aging, it can no longer handle the rigours that it used to handle. And from that, uh, what we're finding is more injuries were sprains and strains uh, and 
the duration for return to work or the resolution of that injury was significantly longer. Um, what we found as well was with the best of intentions, some employers were engaging in practices that they thought would be assisting in helping them with their premium, but were actually breaching the legislation that we have to operate under. And that actually exposes other liabilities and other risks and penalties outside of having a claim and, and, and the premium they pay. Um, a big component of all the feedback we received when speaking to people uh, on site and when we did the focus groups following the, the study was lack of engagement from general practitioners. The difficulty in getting GPs to actually work with uh, employers uh, to get people back to work. And on the other side is not being sure that the general practitioner was actually managing the injury correctly. Uh, and that's something that I wouldn't say, that I'd say from my, uh, my experience, is not unique to the uh, meat industry. That is something that is seen by a lot of people. Then we also found that of the places we went to, <clears throat> very few had actually conducted hazard assessments. Uh, and of those that had, a number of those were unable to show us the written hazard assessment or outline to us what the top hazards were and why. So a lot of people could sit there and say, oh, we think these are the top 10 hazards, but they hadn't actually done the, the work in the background to identify that. So obviously when we look at insurance, understanding your hazards, understanding the risks that those hazards uh, signify, and then understanding how we can control those hazards becomes very, very important. And if we don't have those in place, then it can lead to you know, uh, significant injuries and long-term injuries, which are in turn, large claims costs and high premiums. So from the study, uh, Amanda actually asked us to put together what we would see as the, the initiatives that would be needed by the industry to overcome the issues that we'd identified. After we'd done that, we were then asked to put in some, a funding request to actually implement some initiatives that had been agreed between the AMPC and Aegis uh, and, and AMIC. So what we did there was actually go back and have a good look at where the barriers were, where the drivers of premium were, and turn that around and said, okay, well, how do we think we can address that? And re remembering, we're hypothesising. We're using our knowledge in the industry, our knowledge of what we've, we've seen other people do, what we've done ourselves, to say, hey, this is where we need to look. So what did we come up with? One of the first ones, to address the, the, uh, the knowledge and education in the industry and, actually, and provide some assistance uh, to the processes was to put in place a work, uh, workplace risk advisory line. So that started a couple of weeks ago. You'll find that between the AMPC and ourselves, that'll be uh, quite heavily promoted over the next couple of months. It's a free service where people can call up and get assistance across all areas of uh, return to work, uh, workers' compensation, safety, uh, human resource management and industrial relations. So that's something that's been done between uh, Aegis and AMIC, uh, so resources split across those into their uh, specific areas of expertise. Uh, industry workshops, so the, uh, the presentations that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks with Andrew Douglas were actually a start of workshops we we'd identified for AMPC. These will continue, so there'll be over the next two years, there'll be two more workshops focusing on all areas of workplace risk. So similar things to what we've done in the last couple of weeks, uh, which have been around uh, the you know, uh, performance management, uh, misconduct, um, you know, how to respond to a serious incident. We've got one coming up on hazard assessments in the next couple of weeks. So with these same sort of themes, focusing on that, those areas of workplace risk, there'll be two more workshops. In line with that, we're going to run some more advanced versions of return to work training. So not what you'll go to the insurer and get, which is uh, big on, here's the process, here's the paperwork, here's, what, here's the system. More skills that can actually help move a claim along. So how to talk to a doctor, what information to provide a doctor, how to try and engage a worker more effectively, uh, how to be creative about finding duties, how not to end up in a situation where people are going on workers' compensation to get uh, softer duties, those sort of things. We'll also be looking to run a, uh, a number of webinars 
on issues that come up from the advisory line. So if we're getting a constant theme around bullying and harassment, then what we'd, pro uh, we'd look to do is do a webinar that incorporates some information around bullying and harassment. Uh, same if we're getting some issues around in, you know, issues with ensuring engagement or uh, getting people back to work, trying to find those themes and just fit some information and some advice into a nice one hour uh, webinar on the topics. Um, the other thing that we'll be doing, and hopefully this will be up you know, early next year, is actually putting in place a resource library for AMPC members. So this will be online and it'll be the workbooks that you've seen in the last couple of weeks come out. Uh, it'll be a range of information per state around workers' compensation, HR, safety, industrial relations. So we're trying to build resources that instead of having to go and track them down yourselves all the time, you've got a, a spot where you can go and say, right, I need to know about this. It's in Victoria or it's, if, it's, if it's about work, uh, 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 fair work, then it's obviously the national, national component. Here's what uh, I need to know. And oh, here it is on, on the website. And if it's not there, call in the advisory line, uh, raising that it's an issue. We'll obviously try and track you down some information and get it to you. And then once that information's found, put that into the resource library so it's there for future reference for everybody. Right. Um, sprains, strains, musculoskeletal injuries, lacerations. One of the things that came up when we went back and said, well, look, this is still an issue, is, well, maybe we're not actually enforcing the use of PPE. Maybe our PPE is not appropriate or maybe our PPE is just old. Maybe it, it needs to be replaced. So these sort of things were coming up. So what we want to look at overall is what are the top five areas in the meat uh, processing sector that are causing soft tissue injuries and lacerations? So we're about to send a survey out. It should be out early next week. Uh, that will actually be asking you what are the injuries in soft tissue and lacerations that are causing uh, the most volume of injuries and the most long-term injury. So what's having people off work? Because again, it is being off work that drives your premium. The longer someone's off work, the higher your claims costs will be, which doesn't matter what scheme you're in, whether there's estimates or no estimates, it's going to impact your premium. Once we've got an understanding of what our top five areas are, we'll then be engaging agronomists to actually go and assess a couple of work sites to look specifically at these duties and see whether they can identify why we're having so many injuries and come up with measures to actually counteract that. Uh, when we look at the older and younger workers, the, the aim there is once again education, but more through a media platform. So we've engaged some media specialists. They'll actually be helping us uh, make a couple of video clips, posters, those sort of things that can be played at induction, uh, throughout the year, even get a bit of, of online social media presence with them, around uh, for younger workers, what are the hazards in the industry? So if you're going in there, you know, some of the horrible things we've heard outside of lacerations, uh, young workers watching more experienced guys walk up, put their hands in a big uh, container of hot water uh, to wash their gloves. The younger workers not realising that the people had gloves on are going and putting their hands, their bare hands straight in scalding hot water. Uh, we've had people, you know, younger workers with the, uh, hot water hoses uh, straight down the gum boot. So things like this that they may not actually be aware of can be a big issue and a hazard, making them aware so that workers, hopefully, with a little bit more caution going into the industry, will have less of these injuries that are probably easily avoidable. Um, from a, an ageing workforce perspective, the campaign will focus on getting employers and their workers to understand what happens when people age and how we can't expect someone to be at the same level of fitness they were at 20 when they're at 60. And that if we're expecting them to do the same work, we're probably going to lead to them breaking down. And it's, it's something that leads to a lot of claims. We, the data showed that. Something that leads to very expensive claims. The data showed that as well. And something that employers need to met, learn to address and manage well and not OK, this guy's now 65, we better do something about him. Where's that, where's that point where we need to say, OK, we know these injuries started about 55. We know the claims costs get more expensive at 55. Are these discussions we need to have with people somewhere between that 50 and 55 year, uh, year range? Um, 
we're working uh, with actually with Andrew, who a lot of you know from the last couple of webinars. Andrew's going to put together a guidance note just around some of the uh, legal intricacies of workers' compensation, just to let people understand what they can and can't do and some of the impacts and penalties of trying to be a little too creative uh, and working outside what the legislation says we can do. A uh, simple one there is there are strict guidelines uh, in place around self-insurance, so, you know, which companies can and can't be self-insured and the process that people have to go through to become self-insured. Uh, so uh, the aim there is, or the, what that means is that you can't just decide that you're going to self-insure and pay for things. There are significant penalties towards that. And from the uh, regulator's perspective, it's what they call premium evasion, which they frown on quite significantly. So just a few things around that to make sure that as an industry, if one of the regulators came looking, everyone knows what they need to be doing and everyone is actually doing the right thing. Uh, when we looked at the GP engagement, what we thought would help uh, is getting a couple of experts involved from the lacerations, so ha uh, hand surgeons, uh, you know, uh, surgeons of that nature, and getting uh, physiotherapists involved to do two things. Create what the treatment should be for someone who's had a laceration or had a soft tissue injury. You know, often if it's a laceration, we don't know how deep it is, we don't know the damage, so just stitching that up might lead to further complications, and a lot of GPs don't understand that. From a soft tissue perspective, we find a lot of uh, GPs putting people off work, where we know that by putting someone at home on the couch, the injury is likely to uh, take longer to resolve, or even worse, the body will decondition and the person's capacity will actually uh, become worse than what it was. So identifying how treatment should be approached in both these instances, and then hopefully on the second side, we want to keep this to a, to a short document for the doctors, having what the return to work should look like. So how should someone be returned to work following one of these injuries? How, how much time off should they have, if any? Uh, and what should be the process of engaging with both the worker and employer and getting the person back to work? So if we can actually you know, help doctors understand, here's how you should treat something and here's how you can return them, you should return turn them to work. And it's not someone like myself or, or, an, or an employer saying that, it's actually experts in the field saying, this is what evidence-based medicine says. We might have a bit more of a chance of getting them on site. The aim there will be documents will be created that you can actually send to your, your local doctors to say, hey, our industry's done this. Um, can you please keep this in mind the next time you know, Johnny comes in with a cut hand or you know, Bill comes in with a sore back? Yeah. The hazard assessments, uh, what we thought we'd do there is we're actually going to do another survey a bit, a bit later on where we ask you as an industry to help us identify what your top 10 hazards are. So as an industry, we'll you know, survey, if you went through your site, looking at it from a safety uh, perspective, what do you think are the top 10 hazards? From that, uh, we're going to have Jay McGrath, who's one of our uh, safety guys, who actually talking next week, develop some general controls, just some ideas on what you can do to actually address those, those issues. Uh, obviously, you'll need to look to see whether they work for you, but just to give you some ideas as to, okay, here's a way to approach this. And finally, in that space, developing a compliance checklist. So across the different legislations that we currently operate under, so the whole uh, safety harmonisation never, never took place. Uh, Victoria and WA are still running on their own legislations. So a checklist that looks at every legislation in every state and says, here's what you must have in place as an employer to be compliant in the safety uh, safety space. Oh, turn that again. Okay, so as I said, we'll actually have a survey coming out in the next uh, couple of days uh, for the first part here, which is trying to identify the actual task. So when I say task, not boning, boning's a, a, a role. What, you know, do you know the cut, the position, those sort of things that are causing the injury. If we're looking at people in the packing area, it's not packing because that's the job. What's the component of that job that we can isolate down and say, this is the bit that's causing the injuries. Now, I was watching someone the other day, they had all the whiz -bang technology, had the, uh, the great um, stackers that compress down as more weight goes on them, so the height remains constant. But I was still seeing someone actually, instead of putting a box down that way, turning it sideways, 
leaning between things to put them down. So are these the things that are happening in those roles? Um, and that's what we want to find out. We want to have someone who's an expert turn around and say, well, this is what's happening, and here are the recommendations for how we can overcome that. Okay. Now, any questions on any of that before I move on to the uh, topic of injured worker uh, influencing um, claims liability? I'll take that as a no. That's great when no one can actually talk to you. Okay. So I've been working in this space for 20 years and I've probably been successfully getting claims declined for probably the last 10 years. And it comes to a few things. One of the first things you have to work out is, am I actually trying to decline this claim? Oh, I did get a question. which I can't read. There we go. Simon, just your presentation slide, your slides aren't moving to keep oh. up with what you're speaking about. Okay, so a bit of lag is there. So we're still on the front page. Oh, well, I'm not at my end. It's obviously Give me a second, question. Amanda. Sorry, everyone. We'll just be a second. Thanks, Liz, for... How's that? Yep, things to understand. We're on. Don't know what happened there because they were definitely moving at my end. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, guys. The wonders of modern technology. So what we need to understand when we look at workers' comp is we, we often get frustrated and we think every worker's dodgy, you know, that there are no legitimate claims. My experience says that probably 90%, 95% of claimants are legitimate at the time they launch the claim. Where we often get frustrated is because of competing motivations, people often malinger on a claim. And that can be you know, another 20, 15, 20, 30%, depending on your type of business and the culture. So when we're looking at, the, at fighting a claim, let's be clear, are we actually saying this isn't a valid claim or are we worried that this person will become a malingerer once they're on claim. Because they're very different arguments. And if, if that is your concern, we can't fight that. We can't stop the claim being accepted because you know, we'll talk about it later on, it's a valid claim. This, no matter what jurisdiction you're in, this is not a perfect scheme, right? We need to understand the limitations of the scheme and the fact you know, which you, know, you have to start from, it is deliberately biased to injured workers. So we know, you know, go back in the dark old days, some employers weren't always the nicest to, to workers. That's where a lot of the fair work legislation, works compensation has come from to protect what is what, uh, seen to be vulnerable workers. Now, with that in mind, we need to ensure that we're picking battles that we know we can win. So. Be realistic about it. If, if it's a claim, if the person's injured, accept it. We'll talk a bit later on about if it's perhaps not a legitimate claim, but we can't prove that it's not a legitimate claim, accept it. Now, come at everything with evidence, not emotion. All right, we don't need to go in and get all frustrated over something that we can't prove. In fact, if we can't prove it, why are we even having the argument? I remember a great discussion years ago when I worked at Allianz, an employer saying to me, I think this happened uh, outside of work. And we responded with, okay, great. Where do you think it happened? I don't know. That's your job to find out. Well, vagaries like that won't help us out when we're trying to decline a claim. If we can say, I know that this person fell off the roof on the weekend and that's how they hurt their back and I've had confirmation that they've been, they were in an emergency on the weekend because of this, that's evidence we can work with. Your emotion or your thought that this didn't happen at work doesn't help us. We need proof. The other thing, and I'll go back to this over and over again as we go through this presentation, learn from your experiences. Right? The first time I tried to, decline, uh, to fight a claim, it got accepted. What I learned from that was a different way to, to tackle it, different information to provide, a different approach. 
And I've done that over the last 10 years and actually learnt every time we, we lodge a claim and we dispute it, whether we've won or lost, I've actually learned a little bit more about how to pitch our argument and how to engage the insurer in the process. And that's one thing that you can't you know, uh, forget. I doubt anyone here has had a lot of experience in trying to uh, decline claims. And if they have, probably haven't come from a structured uh, approach based on the legislation. With that in mind, it doesn't mean you can't learn. We all start somewhere. Uh, the other one is, regardless of your thoughts, regardless of whether or not you like the worker or you think it's a valid claim, whilst we're going through the liability process, try and get the worker back to work. Because a lot of claims, even when we think we've got a great argument, will be accepted. It's going to be cheaper for you if they're back at work. If the claim's not accepted, you've still got the person back at work. And remembering throughout all this, it's not your decision as to whether the claim's accepted or declined, it's the insurer's. So if they're back at work and the claim's declined, you can still throw it that it wasn't you who did it, it's actually the insurer who declined the claim and try and keep that relationship with the worker. Okay. All right, everyone see the change in slides this time, Amanda? Yes, thanks, Simon. Okay, good. So I want to take you through, I guess, five processes that I, five steps that I look at when I'm deciding whether or not to fight a claim and then deciding how to go about it. The first part is acceptance. All right, what we need to know is what is a valid claim, right? So is, is it a worker? So is the person our worker? If they're our worker, that's the first step. Was there a work-related incident? And that includes that accumulative effect over time that work has on us. Has this caused an injury or an illness? Has this resulted in incapacity? And or has this resulted in the need for medical and life expenses? If we have that, we have a claim. So if we see someone fall over and break their leg or their arm, why would we fight it? So the first part of this is qualifying. Pardon me. I look at it like, much like new business. We get a lead, which is a claim, and the first thing we want to know is, is this a claim that we can actually should accept or decline, the qualification process. And we'll continue to qualify this as we go through the process. If we've actually looked at it and we've gone, okay, I think we have an argument here to decline this claim. What we need to then understand is, well, what is our argument? because there are only four arguments in most states that you can make about why you want a claim decline. In Victoria and Queensland have an additional one around pre-existing injuries, which we'll go through a bit later on. So is the claimant a worker? That's how claimant's not a worker. So we actually can prove that this person is a contractor, external consultant, they're not deemed a worker under the Act, or they're not, they don't meet the criteria for a worker. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. There is no injury illness. So the person's coming and saying they've got a broken leg, they don't have a broken leg, okay? Um, the injury or illness is not work-related. So they're saying that I've got a bad back due to, due to work, but we can actually show that that bad back is due to something else that they were doing, or they already had a bad back. They've been working with a bad back, and we have in no way made that bad back worse than what it already was. And uh, the final one in most states is reasonable management action. This is uh, around performance management and psychological injuries that, yes, there might be a psychological condition, but that was caused through the reasonable management uh, of the employer, done in a reasonable manner, and there's no claim for compensation based on that. And the final one, it's only in Victoria and Queensland, they both have sections of the Act, Section 41 in Victoria, Section 571 being Queensland, that allow you to ask about pre-existing conditions. We'll go into that a bit longer. It's not as easy as it seems, and there are very few terminations that actually get upheld down that process. Okay, agreement. Step that I think most people miss in this is instead of going to the insurer and arguing with them, going to the insurer, presenting an argument, and getting them to agree to it. What I find if I sit down with an insurer, and I identify to them the reason that we want to dispute the claim and the, the information that we have around that, we have a much greater chance of getting a declincher. 
once they're on board, once the insurer says, I agree with your argument, in my opinion, we are 75 to 80 percent of the way towards declining a claim. After that, what we need is evidence, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So when you're trying to engage the insurer, when you're trying to get them on side, leave emotion out of it, right? Just talk facts. And don't belittle the worker. Don't walk in there and say, he's dodgy, we don't trust him, he's done all these sort of things. Doesn't help. Because what you, you can come across as someone who just doesn't like the worker and wants the claim to climb for those reasons. So if we can start getting the insurer on, on side. So we, we articulate our argument. We, we raise the five reasons that we've got uh, for declining a, uh, arguing a claim above. We actually go in and say, I think we have this argument because of this. Give the insurer the facts. Outline what evidence you've already got. So here's information that I can give you today to support my argument. Here's evidence that I know I can get and can get to you in a week, two weeks, or you know, if we're looking at the liability periods in different states, whatever that period that we have uh, for them to make a decision. Avoid mentioning unsubstantiated rumours or hearsay. Bill heard that Mick really hurt his leg uh, on the weekend. Who did you hear that from? Who did you hear that from? I oh, he heard it from Phil, who heard it from Mike, who heard it from, right, it's, it's too convoluted. If we know that Mick saw Phil fall over and break his leg playing football on the weekend, we have what we call a witness. And the witness we can use. All right? But just having we think or someone said or we heard this in the, in the, the pipeline doesn't help. It's too hard, hard to substantiate. Evidence. All right. Depending on the argument you're going to run, the evidence that you're going to want uh, to provide will change. Some things we look at, assessment of the role. A lot of when we look at physical injuries, this will be essential. What does the role actually entail? Um, if it's a, a, a reasonable management action argument, we'll want to know uh, any, all the information around performance management. When did it start? What did the notes say? What was the issue? If they breached a policy and that led to performance management, we're going to want to see that policy. Pardon me. Because one of the first things that the insurer will need to do is identify, was the policy that was breached reasonable? Because it can't be reasonable management uh, action if the policy you were actually managing against is unreasonable, okay? Position descriptions, CCTV footage, love CCTV footage. Um, if we know they're working somewhere else, identify that, actually identify who the employer is. Um, if it, we're looking at a Section 41 or 571B argument, what injuries did they disclose or not disclose at the time of employment? Okay, And witnesses to their behaviour, their hobbies, and the conduct of people around them in the workplace. Excuse me. <clears throat> the decision. So it doesn't matter how well crafted an argument is, we can still lose. Okay. I oh, apologise, my throat is very dry for some reason. Excuse me. Prepare for surprises. We often have uh, an argument that we think is rock solid, and then something comes out during the, the process. We might find that a witness who's told us one thing when they're uh, actually getting the circumstances investigation done says something else. We've seen that with managers. We've seen that with people who work with uh, on the floor with people who have told us what they saw and changed their story. Okay. Uh, we often see, uh, especially with stress claims, unresolved issues. We might be doing performance management, and that's what we believe the stress is about. There was something that happened six months, nine months ago that was never resolved. And that becomes the claim. So looking at these things that can come up and actually surprise us uh, that we don't know about. So we, when we look at what we're trying to do to argue these, we want to know about everything. Uh, but either way, regardless of what the decision is, learn from it. So if we if we win, why did we win? Actually have that discussion with the insurer. What was the evidence that held the most weight? What was the evidence that we provided that, that enabled us to get this decision? If we lost, let's find out why we lost. Why was the claim accepted? Now, if the claim was accepted because along the way it turned out that the claim was valid, we probably should have pulled the pin and had to accept it anyway. 
And if it got all the way through and it turns out that there's all these clinical notes from the doctor saying, I've been treating this person for six months for this injury that they told me happened at work on this date, and we have an incident report from the worker on that date saying, here's what I did. We just need to move on and go, well, Jays, we got this wrong. We shouldn't have challenged in the first place. We should have accepted the claim. Okay. So let's look at how we argue. Okay. So one thing to remember, I've never seen an employer write on a claim form, I don't think this is work-related, and had a result based on that one little sentence where the claim was declined. All right. The onus is on us as the employers to prove that they are not that we are not liable. Okay. The worker just needs to lodge a claim, provide a medical certificate, and unless we challenge that, that will be accepted. And even if we do challenge that, if it goes off to the uh, to an IME and we're not giving them any evidence, it will probably still be accepted. Okay? One of the things you want to look at when you're looking at uh, disputing claims. Who's giving who information? The worker's telling the insurer how the injury happened. The worker's telling the insurer the, the extent of that injury. The worker is then going to an IME, an independent doctor, and saying, this is what happened. This is how heavy my job is, or this is how stressful my job is, and this is how incapacitated I am. And if we don't provide the doctors and the insurers with con uh, countering evidence to that, that's all they can make the judgment on. All right. The other side is control the process, right? Don't leave it up to the insurer. So engage the insurer early. Look at what information you can provide. Look at what evidence you can gather and look at what witnesses you can identify to assist you in the process. Because if you're just writing that little thing on the bottom of the thing that says, I don't believe this is work related, then you're not going to get a very good outcome. Excuse me. So one of the first things I, you know, we look at is, is someone actually a worker? So if we're going to make the argument that someone's not a worker, people often get caught up in what they believe. We had an agreement that they're a contractor, not a worker. They signed a contract that says they're a contractor, not a worker. They've got their own ABN. Uh, their business is a proprietary limited. They even have their own workers' compensation policy. None of those things make them uh, not a worker. So there's actually a case... Uh, a few cases we see where a sole trader has gone and got a workers' compensation policy. The irony being there, a sole trader is not covered under workers' compensation. They do not meet the definition of a worker. They can still get a policy because their policy would cover anyone they employ, but it doesn't provide them with any cover. All right? When we start to look at what makes someone a worker, we go to common law. So at common law, they've created five tests. And I've the workbook you, you've got, the uh, Appendix A, actually has a lot more detail on what these tests are, the questions that get asked and what you look at. But what we, we tend to look at is, do we have control? So can we actually control this person? Can this person delegate? If they can delegate, it starts to suggest that they're not a worker. So I don't have full control because this person can now delegate. Are they bringing their own equipment? Uh, or am I supplying everything? Are they quoting? How are they quoting? Um, if they're out in public, are they representing me or themselves? So who's getting the goodwill? If they go and do work on my behalf, does everyone think they're working for me? And if you do, they do a great job, then that's great for me. The risk test. Right? If something is, is actually uh, not done uh, appropriately, who bears the cost of, repa of repairing that? So if I engage someone to build a wall, and that wall falls down. Do they have to actually uh, bear the cost of fixing that wall to making it up to where it should be, or is that on me? Okay. So what evidence would we look at? So if we're looking at evidence to dispute that someone is our worker, we want to look at the contract. So now, as I said, said before, the contract's not, the, not that important, but we want to look at it to see what it actually outlines. Because if it clearly outlines they're, they're a worker, we, then we don't have to worry about it. But if it's suggesting they're a contractor, we then need to look at the behaviour. So we want witnesses to the behaviour of what's occurred. Okay. Invoices. So are they invoicing? How are they invoicing? And what are they itemising on those invoices? Same with quotes. Do they provide quotes for the work? 
uh, what are they putting on that quote? So they outline the, the um, equipment they're supplying, the people they're using. Do they advertise? So if you actually know that these people are advertising their services, that's great evidence to give to an insurer to say, well, if they're not conducting their own business, why are they advertising on Google or Seek or these other places? Um, if we know the people they're engaging, so if we know that they've got a crew, even if they're only using them sometimes, good information to have. If we know they perform work for other organisations, good to be able to have witnesses to that effect. Also, if you can identify times where you ask them to do work for you and they couldn't do it because they were working elsewhere. Um, probably one of the most significant claims I worked on in this area was a, a guy who was a contractor, was engaged by one of my clients to clear a field. Uh, unfortunately, there was a half buried acetylene bottle that wasn't identified when they walked around the field. He drove over that in a thrasher. Uh, it exploded instantly. It was pulled off the tractor. Uh, severe burns, very terrible case. Despite being uh, asked by my client on several occasions to go and get himself some cover because he was not, you know, not covered by anything, he hadn't taken any cover out. Obviously, can't work. A lot of medical bills. What do people do? They look for help, and they often go, "Well, I can't afford this." I don't, my medical insurance uh, won't cover this. So I don't, I've got no income protection insurance. I'm going to say that I was actually employed and put a claim in. The way he put it forward uh, to the untrained eye was quite convincing, right down to the fact that the circumstance investigator had made her decision that he was a worker before even speaking to my client and was asking my client questions like, where do you pay your super? How much tax do you take out? To which my client kept responding, I don't because he's not an employee. As late in the piece as a day before a decision had to be made, the insurer contacted us and said, everything we have says he's a worker. What have you got that says he's not? So we went and sat in there the next day and we went through a whole range of invoices. And on, on these invoices, he'd actually itemised when he'd done the work and when someone else had done the work, because he billed himself out at a higher rate than what he billed out uh, his employees. On top of that, we put it to them. We know he has people, because it's itemised in these invoices. On top of that, he had three people working for him the day of the explosion. In fact, one of those risked his own life to pull him out of the tractor and save him. What if it had been not the claimant on the tractor, but one of his staff? Would we be having this discussion? And we wouldn't have been. It would have been a different discussion where WorkSafe was actually talking to the claimant about being uninsured. Because by not having a policy in place, not only was he not covered, he did not cover any of his, his employees either. So looking at that, the invoices, the witnesses, the supply of equipment were all things that we used to prove that this person was not a worker of, the, of uh, my client but was actually a, an independent contractor who should have had cover for himself and his own people. Excuse me. No injury or illness. This is probably the one where we have the least control. At the end of the day, this is more likely to be a medical question. Person saying, I said, I've got a broken leg. We've got scans. <clears throat> the IME uh, looks at scans and says, there's nothing wrong with you. <clears throat> Bad back, the IME does an exam and says, I can't find anything wrong with you. All right. It's a much harder argument because most people have something wrong with them. Most of people throw something in because they know well, a little bit of non-specific lower back pain, a little bit of non-specific shoulder pain, all nice, very general generic things that can substantiate a claim. Okay, So with this, it's really going to be a lot of work for the insurer, but it is you making sure the insurer does the work. All right. Get some clinical notes. You'll be surprised, you know, if someone's telling you they've got all these issues, surely their doctor would have recorded it, right? Be surprised the number of times that the only time the doctor's heard about it is the day the person goes and lodges a claim. Uh, the IME, so make sure the insurer sends them off to an IME to see is there actually anything there. <clears throat> Witnesses, CCTV footage, incident reports can assist if we can say, well, the worker said they were injured doing this and we can't find that on CCTV. TV footage, 
or which is rare the worker has the claimant has actually admitted to someone there's nothing wrong with me i'm just going to take the company for a ride it, all those things can help but they very rarely they very rarely come up but keep your eye out for them if they do Put it again injury or illness is not work related what we're doing here is not actually saying we don't think um, someone's actually got an injury we're saying we're not liable for that injury so we look at three things here we're looking at can we refute the incident reported by the claimant so how they're saying that they were injured can we actually counter that and say that didn't happen um, or can we show that what they're saying happened is unlikely to have caused the injury right and on top of that can we identify a viable non-work related alternative to how this injury may have occurred so if we look at this what we look at is there we go um cctv footage if you've got that in your place it is great if you can actually if the worker says i was injured on this day on this job at around this time and we've got footage to show that nothing occurred that makes life very easy uh, assessment of the role i talk about this a lot if you're going to send someone to an ime the worker is the only person who they're talking to Worker is going to say my job is very heavy and i have to lift 25 kilos uh you know 50 times an hour right i don't know many jobs where that actually happens so having an assessment of the role that you can send to the insurer to give to the ime to say okay this is actually what the role entails okay these are the things uh, these are the things that will actually impact, um, you know, the worker does day in, day out, and they don't do anything but this. Then if we can have witnesses to say we did or did not see the incident, to find out about the claimant's hobbies, to find out about any alternative employment, and on top of that, looking at blogs, Facebook, those sort of things to see whether there's any mention that they were injured doing something else. Now, give you an example here. Uh, a claim from many years ago now a lady walked into my my client and said i injured my back there's nothing i do at home that could have done it so it must have happened here so first red flag okay well, I've, I've got a problem and i need to fix and i can't tell you how it happened when she actually provided the claim form she stated a very specific role and a date now always go and check the date always go and make sure the worker was there there have been a number of workers who have lodged claims from past periods who we actually found were on you know the date they're saying they're injured they're actually on annual leave or it was a day off it was an RDA. all right keep that in mind in this case she was there and she was doing that role but the role was extremely light she had an l5s1 disc prolapse which is generally associated with heavy lifting the role she was doing was at bench height and the heaviest thing she had to lift and it was very occasionally was five kilos so we assessed that role and we sent that information off to the, the IME. On top of that, we asked around the workplace and it came out that this lady was actually running her own wholesale egg business. So we got witness statements identifying that and sent that through to the IME as well. He came back with the statement, which we, we were pretty confident we'd get. I can't see how this injury could have occurred doing the role uh, that she's identified at work. However, I can see that a role, uh, a job as a wholesale uh, of eggs would incur this job and this injury. The similar one, we had a guy whose job was all gross motor who actually put a claim in for carpal tunnel syndrome. We identified that he was a career musician, guitarist, analyzed the job, got witness statements about his guitar playing, the, the IME coming back and saying, A, can't see how this job could have caused it, b carpal tunnel is a common injury for people who play the guitar so you see how it's not just saying i don't think it happened it's actually doing the work and going and finding the evidence to give to the insurer to actually help them make their, their decisions reasonable management action this is one that employers get wrong a lot they pretty much go, well, I want to sack him or I'm not happy with him and he's now he's upset, so I, I want to cover on reasonable management action. You can't retrospectively do reasonable management action. This is going to come down to your policies, procedures and documentation. 
So that bit where someone just continually grabs someone off the floor and tells them they're not very good at their job and they need to improve, that is not performance management and that is not reasonable management action. In fact, given the repetitive nature of that, it could constitute bullying. Right. The other thing though with uh, psychological injury that people often don't understand, it doesn't have to be repeated. It can be one incident. One incident is all it takes for a claim. Was there an incident? Did I have a reaction to that? And has that reaction led me to be off work or requiring medical treatment? And it's the perception. So remember the perception which makes it harder because we perceive things in so many different ways that anyone can perceive something and say oh, it upset me and I had this reaction. So getting your documentation right, ensuring that you've got a good, solid, reasonable process around performance management, Ensuring that your line managers and supervisors are aware of this process so they don't go and do anything rogue. My concern whenever we go start down this path is what aren't we being told? As I had one recently where I thought we had, a, we had it all locked up under reasonable management action. Manager assured us that they'd never really argued with this person. Uh, there was always the other person arguing with them and they, they'd always kept it very calm. Not only during the circumstance investigation did other people say there was a stand-up fight between the two of them where you could hear the abuse from both parties out in the store. The manager, under the, when the, they were doing the uh, their factual statement, actually stated, yes, I yelled at the person. So finding out the truth can often be hard. You go down an argument where you think you've got information and someone turns around and says, okay, yeah, we were reasonably doing reasonable management action, oh, but by the way, I yelled at them here, I yelled at them here, or this person yelled at them over there. All these things that can actually hurt us. So it's not just, did we follow a reasonable process? It's, did we follow that in a reasonable manner? So getting a witness to uh, be present in, in any performance management is vital because it gives you someone who can comment on how was the process actually conducted. And as I was saying, ensure there's nothing else that's going to come up. I've seen things that have come up from nine months before performance management had started that have got a, a claim for psychological injury up. So making sure your house is in order and you're not leaving things uh, unresolved. So what will the insurer want? What, what can you provide them to assist you with the performance management argument? Your policy. They're going to want to be able to make a determination as to whether your performance management policy is, is reasonable. Then any policies they've breached, as I said before, they will then want to look at was the policy they breached reasonable. File notes. So all the documentation that you should be taking throughout this process, you want to be able to provide to the insurer. Any letter, email, correspondence provided to or from the worker around the process, confirming that they're engaged in the process. Witnesses to the behaviour of the claimant. So if we're saying we're performance managing for these reasons, it's good to have witnesses to actually substantiate that yes, the performance management was valid. And witnesses, as I said before, to confirm how we conducted the process. Okay. Pre-existing injury or illness. Once again, uh, for the states we can do this, so Victoria and Queensland, this hinges on the employer's processes and documentation. So we have to prove that the claimant understood the requirements of the role. So when this first became available, everyone thought, great, we're given this form, they sign that form, they lie on it, we don't have to pay a claim. The lawyers came, uh, sat down and said, but hold on, I don't, he didn't know, he didn't know what the job entailed. So if he'd known what the job entailed, he would have told you about this injury. But since he didn't, he couldn't, and therefore there's, there's a claim. So you actually have to have a very good process at engagement before you've made an offer of employment that says this is the physical and cognitive demands of the role, a nice document that outlines that very clearly. Then you have the, the, the required declaration for each state, pretty similar, just tweaks based on their version of the, the legislation. Um, so if we have the documentation, we know that they understood it. We also have to prove that they knew they had the injury. A lot of us carry issues. A lot of us will not have will have disc bulges. They're just asymptomatic. If we don't know about it, how can we tell you that it's an issue that might stop us doing the job, All right? And then so if we've got, they know what the job is. We've got, they know the injury. Then they should have known that that injury or illness was going to impact on their ability to do the job. 
So, evidence, position description, overview of what the job entails, inherent requirement assessment, so an assessment of the physical and cognitive demands of the role, the signed declaration, right? Witnesses to any comments the worker has made about a pre existing condition, and witnesses that confirm the worker didn't have to do anything outside of what was provided in that original documentation about their position and the physical and cognitive demands. There's no use, so I'm in a white collar role, I could sign something saying I can do this job. But I may have a, a bad back, but a bad back, it's not that big an issue. I've got an ergonomic chair, an ergonomic setup. But if my boss asked me to help him move a desk, and I put my back out, nothing that I've signed back here will actually help. Because I, I, if I'd been told that I had to move desks in this job, I could have said, well, yes, I have a bad back, and therefore, if I have to move a desk, I'm going, I might injure myself. Right? So you have to make sure that they're only doing the physical requirements of the role you've employed them for. This can become hard when we, we have job, uh, uh, organisations where we promote people. Given that, it's often best to go with what's the highest possible physical capacity the person may need and have them sign off against that. And if they say, I can't do that, then you work your way back down, but you at least know not to promote them above their capacity. Okay. And that is it for me. The only thing I'd like to do uh, before questions is just remind everyone that the AMPC is part of that initiative has put a, a advisory line in place. Um, call up, uh, we've got young Sam who'll be triaging any calls that come through and direct them to either ourselves or uh, Ken and Steve at AMIC uh, to provide assistance uh, across a range of areas uh, of you know, so workers' compensation, safety and HRIR issues. Any uh, questions about anything I spoke about? Thanks, Simon. That was a great presentation. Uh, so far, no questions have come through. Um, Jay, because I put him on the slate. Maybe Jay, if you want to actually write your question, if you're trying to ask a question, if you go to your questions tab and type it in there, that'd be great. Just while we're waiting, if any questions come through, Simon, I noted um, from the first project that was conducted that a lot of people didn't have risk, risk assessments and that completed, um, mm. that they were able to actually show. One of the initiatives that AMPC can help with is through our um, PIP, our plant initiated projects, is to be able to help companies design and develop some of those risk assessments um, with providers of their choice, where we can actually match it with some funding. Uh, part, part of the requirement is that we'll be able to gather some data for research purposes, but we are able to assist there. Likewise, if, the, if companies have one of those danger zones that you were talking about, um, you know, top, top five priority areas that they want to focus on, and they'd actually like to do something about it, um, but they, and there's a research and development component to it, it might be, you know, needing to put new light sensors in, um, being able to test light sensors in a wet area, for example, um, that they may not have used previously we can um, help look at those areas as well. So if anyone does have any safety project or so, even in the safety cultural space that they're interested in doing, get in contact with me and I'll be more than happy to talk through um, the possibilities of us being able to assist them. Uh, no, Jay didn't have a question. So it looks like you've got out of this very easily, Simon. So well done. I'll, 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 I'll hang up now. Yeah, um, so just as we conclude now, thanks very much to Simon for imparting his knowledge to us all today. If anyone does have any further questions, feel free to come either through myself or go to Simon Direct. I don't know if you've got your email address on any of your slides, Simon. Um, this no, presentation it's will... It is in the workbook, Amanda. Oh, fantastic. This presentation will also be available um, online as well, if anyone would like it. Now, next Wednesday, so we're going to change the date. Next Wednesday, we've got our final um, component to the day, and it's actually going to be with Jay, and he's going to be talking about understanding and assessing workplace hazards. So that will be the last of this four-part series. And we really encourage people to use the hotline um, that we've set up, 
it's a great service that you can use now. Um, that number's there for all your workers' comp, work safety and HRIR issues. Uh, it is something we're trialling for the next 12 months, so um, hopefully the membership will find that it's very beneficial. And we look forward to you participating in the survey that's coming up as well. Just as we conclude this webinar, you will be asked to conduct a survey on the webinar. It would be fantastic if you can fill that out because that will give us feedback for all our future webinars. So, Simon, have you got any last concluding words? No, the only thing I'd say is, you know, even the topic that I was talking about today, if people need advice or guidance on that, they can call the, the advisory line for that and we're there to help. Fantastic. Well, thanks everyone um, and enjoy your afternoon. Thanks, Amanda.